step chain right there. Now the reflection, maybe my polemical piece, I guess, is that um, is that we really should be looking at aggregate distances as well. I say as well because I don't want to say don't look at the individual features because after all, once you have a good sense of where the aggregate distances are between varieties, another immediately interesting question is what causes those. Right? And that's always going to be a characterization of individual features or the frequency with which individual features are realized. By a feature, of course, I mean something like the pronunciation of a phoneme or the application of a, uh, uh, equivalently, the application of an allophonic rule or the frequency with which that's applied, um, etc. Um, we are not bothered here because we're looking at a very large amount of data that there will be counterindicating features. Those will exist. There will be people that have, given the mobility of the U.S., even in those days, there were counterindicating, uh, possible counterindicating features. Not because the people had moved, the Lancet uh, field workers were careful about that, but because of contact, okay, because people had served in the army, for whatever reason. Uh, that's not a problem if we're looking at enough data. In fact, we can characterize how much data is necessary by looking at the degree of which uh, data items correlate and looking at the reliability you get um, given the correlation that we find. Um, and a final point that I think points, a uh, final uh, reflection that points uh, to the need to look at a linguistic variety rather than just individual features is that we use that so often theoretically. We talk about the variety that is spoken in, um, in Birmingham, for example, or in Tuscaloosa, something like that. And we'd like to be able to characterize that, even though we know that variation is inherent to that at every level, down in the idiom, but still, if it is a theoretical construct at all, it, um, it ought to be one that we can characterize, and we're only going to characterize it if we look at the sum of linguistic habits and um, customs that, that, are, that are in use in a particular place. Thank you. Bye. fascinating. I learned a lot from this. And I just wondered if you have any advice for those of us who are sort of on the ground. Does this have applicational value outside of um, corporate analysis? Some advice. Well, that's, that's a good question. Could you apply this if you didn't have a fairly large corpus uh, to analyze? Uh, at this stage of the game, I think it would be very risky, frankly, because you wouldn't know how to interpret. If you're just comparing two or three places, you yeah. can do that consistently, but you might have trouble interpreting the results you've got. So I think at this point, it would be, uh, it would be a risky thing to do based on just two or three places. I have two more questions. One thing that uh, I'm not sure if anybody's aware of is that there's an initiative called the TSL initiative that's being proposed to the NSF to take some of the money that, the, that Congress has agreed to support NSF with 25 million more than their additional than the funding they have now. There's a group that's trying to organize a, a bid and they're sort of floating what's called a white paper around the NSF to make it an initiative within linguistics so that they get five million of that money to, to support pretty much what you're talking about with data sharing so that it would support large scale projects that result in the public sharing of data. And obviously there's a lot of corporate based interest in this and most of the people that are on the panel, a lot of the ones that were that went into drafting the initiative were people that deal with a lot of corpus data, but there were also sociolinguists and phoneticians on that panel and that have provided some ways that data could be shared. And so there may be a good uh, motivation both to do research that would allow us to move to that level. We have data from a bunch of different areas and there might soon be a lot more uh, availability of that if this gets passed. And one of the things they need is for a lot of linguists to support this initiative to sh and so to, to sort of 
be thinking about projects that might use this to, so that when the NSF decides on whether to fund this initiative, there are proposals that can be turned in. So I think we're moving in that direction. Just for people that might be interested, think of a proposal. Any comments from Jim? It would be fantastic, and if you need a letter of support from the Dutch Science Foundation, I think I can get you one. <laughs> and one more question. Uh, in the Atlas of North America, uh, in English, we defined uh, two measures of the value of an isoglossus which are maximized by various techniques. And one of these uh, is homogeneity, that is, what percentage of a given marked feature is found within the boundary. And the other is consistency, that is, given the number of marked features in the area as a whole, uh, then what percentage is concentrated within the boundary. So in one, if you have language change in progress, for example, you do not expect high homogeneity because you'll have older speakers within the boundary who don't have it and younger speakers who do. But for old established features, we're going to get uh, high homogeneity, especially those that are geographically confined. And I was wondering, in your algorithm, is there any reflection of this difference? Because uh, we, we don't feel at the moment that you can use either one criterion uh, without considering the other, and you have to somehow maximize both. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and it brings up an important point. Should you weight all of the data points to the same degree in trying to define what a dialect area is? And um, in addition to uh, experiments that, uh, that we've tried to conduct, uh, we've also used work by Hans Birbel in this, and he's looked at basically a kind of inverse frequency weight. So if it turns out that um, two places share a very unusual feature, that's a particularly strong reason for identifying it, for saying that there's um, a reason to think there must be a kind of link there, a kind of contact there. And it's a, it almost falls out of assumptions about, uh, about the the significance of how to interpret features that people in information theory have also taken up. We have not got any such weighting. Um, that's the only weighting that we've used uh, significantly. So in the, the paper on the lexis, on the, uh, sorry, the lexical uh, analysis of lens, I used a weighting like that to benefit. That helped quite a lot. And I have not used anything like consistency or Geographic coherence, I guess. We didn't quite get the second, the first word, I guess, he used. We have not used that. Okay, thank you, John.